We have an amazing talk coming up here uh, with uh, Jerry Carson uh, in, at the University of Maryland. And I believe uh, Ray Sedwick is uh, unfortunately right now at this exact moment right in class, so he couldn't uh, uh, couldn't make it. But uh, Jerry is uh, carrying the water. Um, so Jerry, you have the con, and uh, I will give you kind of that two minute squeak uh, when the time comes, just to let you know. So um, uh, you go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Ray did make it. Yay. All right. Ray, yeah. It. Yep. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. Just a second. Let me get where I can see it. All right. So um, again, uh, just like to repeat the uh, thanks uh, to Sonny and LSI for, for sponsoring this research. Uh, I think we've uh, seen a lot of interesting things today and hopefully <clears throat> we'll walk through a couple of results which you might find interesting. I'll be presenting today for myself and and for for Ray uh, who is the PI on this uh, task. We're going to be looking at uh, direct fusion drive based on centrifugal mirror confinement and we'll start off with just a uh, uh, review of some stuff we talked about the last time how centrifugal mirror confinement works and uh, and how we integrate that with a uh, with a propulsion system, and dive in at that point to some uh, new developments in reactor dynamics and propulsion performance, and uh, then talk a little bit about our conceptual uh, engine that we're using for our balance of plant and mass properties uh, um, estimate. So uh, centrifugal mirror confinement is is mirrors combine magnetic and mirror confinement with a high E cross B drift velocity. The resulting radial and axial forces confine the plasma to a well. It's an annular plasma region where thermonuclear fusion conditions can be attained. And if you look at the schematic in the lower left, uh, you see the mirror magnets and you know, that impose those green uh, B field lines. And then the, uh, the outer and inner elect central electrodes which uh, generate the E field and they result in a plasma well, which is for this configuration, a donut shaped uh, region that uh, where the, uh, the the fusion happens. The uh, schematic on the left is uh, simulated, uh, the simulation of that schematic is shown on the right. It's bisected at the mid plane. So that white region to the left is, 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 the, is one half of the plasma. Uh, CM's been demonstrated uh, in the U.S. and Sweden and in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. More recently, the Maryland Centrifugal Experiment in the 2000s uh, demonstrated a confinement of a 100 EV plasma. So that was progress on their way to where they are now with Centrifugal Mirror Fusion Experiment. It's a follow-on to MCX, and you'll see a photo up there in, in the, on the right of the current state of the experiment. It's a collaboration between UMD and University of Maryland, Baltimore County being funded by ARPA-E. Uh, they are currently doing limited experiments uh, with deuterium and hydrogen, and, uh, but mostly they're, we're just working on getting their instruments refined to the point that they can uh, get their uh, you know, burning plasma experiments done the second half, start the second half of this year. For a, Propulsion application, the centrifugal mirror uh, would be operated in tandem with a warm plasma propulsion system. Here's a just a, a simple schematic of the system. We have the reactor in the middle, and particles are leaving through both sides uh, through the mirrors. Uh, and on the jet side, the right side, they enter the propellant, heat the propellant, which then passes out to generate thrust. On the forward side, uh, particles leave and enter a, uh, a direct energy conversion system. In our case, it's a standing wave direct energy conversion system, and that produces the power to run the reactor. So that's a, that kind of brings us up to where we are. During the first uh, half of the grant, we concentrate on deuterium tritium systems as that gave us a lot of insight into the reactor and the warm plasma. Um, since uh, the last time we talked, we've updated our, our reactor model to include uh, more reactions, and, and now we're we're focusing on uh, deuterium and helium three. But uh, before I talk about some of those results, uh, the the results you see here on this page are from the DT tests, 
we identified something we call the critical Mach number. And the plot to the left is the Mach number uh, as a function of the mirror ratio, mirror ratio being the, the ratio of the mirror strengths and the, the mid-plane uh, magnetic field. And for our systems, we'd like to keep those relatively low to allow as much material as possible to go to the, uh, to the propulsion system. But uh, in these systems, you know, intuitively, you would think that the higher the Mach number, the lower you would have to have the mirror ratio. Well, that's true up to a point, and that point is the, the critical Mach number. The Above that point, the thermal ions are relatively well confined, but the fast fusion products are only mirror confined. They're not centrifugally confined. They continue leaving at the same rate, but it's a lot more expensive to replace them at the high Mach number. So the system responds by increasing the mirror ratio again. And that's the behavior we see repeatedly, no matter what fuel we're running and what conditions or regime we're running. It's also, uh, evident from these data from the, from the simulations that viable solutions for self-powering reactors tend to operate in the vicinity of the critical Mach number. And you see on the second curve, the QA equal to one, that is a break-even point where the reactor is self-powering. And the Mach number for that is relatively close to the, uh, for the, to the critical Mach number, just a little bit higher. So it's clear we'd like to know what this, it, it would be convenient to know what this critical Mach number is um, so we don't have to do lots of simulations and sift through data. And, and uh, the you, you can observe the critical Mach number from the data, um, but looking at the thermodynamics, uh, the, the hypothesis is the, the critical Mach number is the point where the energy losses from the uh, thermal species equal that of the prompt fusion species. And that's what that relation in the bottom right is. The, uh, you know, the higher the energy of the thermal nuclear reaction, the higher the Mach number. Now, I should say that sigma energy is for any uh, primary reaction as well as any relevant side reaction. So for a DHE3 system, that would include both uh, the deuterium, deuterium, and the deuterium, tritium side reactions. In the denominator, you have the plasma temperature, and that 1.82, it, it, it's not a curve-fitting value. It's actually thermodynamically derived. It, it's technically, or theoretically, it is the ratio between the, uh, the rate of thermal ions leaving the systems to the rate of prompt ions leaving the system. And that number is pretty stable um, in, in the vicinity of the uh, critical Mach number, about 1.8 to 1.84. So given that uh, relation, you, you can stake out uh, a lot more quickly than we used to be able to do, um, you know, where to look for uh, a viable solution. Oh, on the propulsion performance side, we did go back and look at the data from all of our simulations on our 1D warm plasma model. And uh, we're able to infer some other parametric, you know, you know, parametric relations describing the, the behavior of the warm plasma. Uh, fusion energy deposition depends on transport properties. And as you can see on the chart to the left, the electron uh, collision time uh, on that blue line is a lot lower than you know, the uh, corollary for, for the bra for the propellant uh, species. So the electrons heat up a lot faster and for light nuclei, they pass on that energy relatively quickly to the ions. So you see the temperatures tend to equilibrate as shown in that middle curve. For heavier ions, if you say you have a, new, a nitrogen uh, propellant. Uh, the heat transfer to the ions is much less efficient. So you end up having a very high temperature electron gas and relatively cold ions. And, and that's a fundamentally different type of, of plasma. So when we wrap all this together and try to get a propulsion efficiency out of it, uh, that curve to the right uh, started out as a, a plot of simulation cases. And, and the question uh, came up, why are they grouped so closely together? Well, did some analysis and found out there's a relation that you can, that follows a specific impulse. The, the higher the specific impulse, the higher the 
the the uh, the uh, the efficiency tends to be, but with the caveat that there's that that, that chi factor that you know, if you have a a lot of ionization energy, then that tends to lower the efficiency. So um, that is the case with heavier nuclei where you have a high temperature for the electrons that results in multiple charge states, high Zs. So that that it draws the efficiency back down again a bit. So, you know, these are these relations, including the the uh, the maximum theoretical uh, efficiency uh, just below the first equation, um, are again helpful in characterizing the systems. As we do our our uh, planning, our simulations is very helpful in doing that. So that brings us to. Uh, a, a, an important part of our task with LSI is, is to characterize with some degree of rationality you know, what the mass properties you know, for, a, for a system might be. And this is our design cycle one. The one megawatt jet power delivered using D helium three as a fuel. It's a 96 keV plasma. Uh, expect to operate it off of uh, ammonia or water, water as propellants. Those are good because they they have a very high storage density, but they also have a very high hydrogen content once they're dissociated and ionized, and that that makes for an effective propellant. This particular uh, model has an 80 kilowatt neutron power from the side reactions, and it's fairly effectively mitigated uh, by the white flight weight um, um, shielding uh, in terms of protecting the magnets. So you see the, the major components there, the reactor in the middle, uh, the, uh, the standing wave direct energy conversion to the left. And, and again, these are all, uh, the proportions are all correct for this particular design. And the propulsion system, the, the reason why it's, it's a little bit wider is we only have the mirror magnet and the nozzle magnet. We don't have field magnets to constrain the, uh, the plasma. So we have to let, the, uh, the plasma expand to the uh, last uh, good flux surface. Uh, you'll see also reservations for the power electronics, which take the power from the SW deck and, and turn it into power usable by the reactor. So uh, moving on, uh, we haven't, I haven't completed the mass properties analysis, but uh, the 25 kilograms per kilowatt looks feasible at this point. Uh, the, the uh, the reactor and the SW deck were uh, were scaled based on a base best in class current of DHE three solutions that's uh, 800 kW per meters cube, and the although at this point the propulsion performance uh, calculations are parametric using the relations from a couple of charts ago, a couple of technology assumptions that. Uh, We'll get flight weight radiation tolerant HTS magnets. We're not going to be able to do a 20,000 ton or 20,000 pound uh, magnet like Spark has for 20 Tesla. Uh, we'll need to have uh, you know 20 to 30% that weight. The power electronics also have to be similarly uh, you know, scaled. Uh, fundamentally new architectures are probably required, not necessarily new technology, but new architectures. Anticipate using liquid metal heat pipes for the thermal management system, and also because the system is 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 very effective at combining the plasma, uh, we're going to have a buildup of helium in the reactor well, which we'll need to mitigate uh, somehow, and and so we need to get a better insight into the transport of those species in the reactor, so we'll understand how we might be able to remove them. The uh, characteristics in these tables on the right, you know, the the the, the key numbers on the reactor is the Mach 13 uh, operate, uh, excuse me, Mach 11 uh, operating for the uh, for the reactor, and a 1.5 uh, megawatt output power from the reactor. And by the time you get a 70 percent or so propulsion efficiency, that gives you a one megawatt delivered. So some observations, uh, as I said, we spent a good part of the uh, first part of the of the grant looking at DT solutions. Um, but when you start looking at actual systems and, and the, the sizes of things and the structures, the you quickly come to the conclusion that the uh, that these 
are problematic because the flu the neutron fluxes are so high. You know, the and the shielding is prohibitively heavy. It's true that there are plenty of neutrons to self-power the reactor, but the thermal conver conversion cycles are heavy and the efficiencies are 35 to 45 percent, which means you're going to have to dissipate. Uh, the balance to space, which means, you know, very large radiators, which we prefer to avoid. By contrast, the DHE3 systems provide high power density and low neutron flux. Uh, the downside is that the E field scale with the square root of the electron temperature. So the biosync potentials for these systems are two to three teams times higher than that of a DT. Um, back again to the idea of the critical Mach number, it's you know, across the board, it's, we observe that the, the jet power is maximized when the reactor operates in the vicinity of the critical Mach number that's shown in the curves to the left. Uh, finally, just a reminder that there are, required, there are development required for the HTS and power electronics um, that are needed to make a overall viable uh, uh, propulsion system. So, you know, those are would be separate and apart and, and challenges in their own right. But I just wanted to remind the folks that this is a system what we're looking at and there are some developments necessary to make the system as a whole work. So uh, next steps, uh, the propulsion uh, calculations this time around were parametric. I need to update the warm plasma 1D simulation to account for the deposition and the characterized de deposition of these you know, different types of uh, high energy species from the reactor. Uh, do some more analysis to see if there are any higher performing DHE3 point design points that we can use. At that point, I'll go back and complete the uh, balance of plant design with a cycle two and you know, try to get to a five megawatt jet powered position uh, type of system. And, and then the final part of the, uh, the, the task is to develop a conceptual design for experiments to, to characterize the reactor and warm plasma interface. We've made a fair number of assumptions about what the interface looks like. Um, and we have some analytic approaches we can do to, to do that. But we're also going to try to do some experiments possibly based off of CMFX uh, reuse uh, to, uh, to evaluate that experimentally. And I think that is all I have for today.